Good morning and welcome to Christian Baptist Church. If you're joining with us for the first time this morning, we're really glad that you've joined us, especially if you've come in on uh, Facebook Live or one of the other services uh, that we're providing. We're really glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, and uh, we're trusting that this will be a blessing to you, that it will be an encouragement to you, uh, and hopefully uh, a means of you connecting closer with, uh, with God, with our Savior this week. Um, I'm going to ask Harold if you would open this morning's service uh, in prayer. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, church. Newmarket, Huntsville, Alberta, and even Azerbaijan. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, The beauty and glory of the Sabbath day is one of the largest and most important part of all of your creation. And dear Father, we pray that you would help us to latch on to the understanding of how important that the Sabbath day as the climactic part of your creation is to us yet today, thousands of years later. What being involved in this is giving us opportunity to grow and to grow close to you, dear Father. But not only that, we are learning that it's during the involvements in these Sabbath day activities that we learn ways to attain freedom from the things that get in the way of us. Today, we're going to learn more about the freedoms that Pastor Andrew will be sharing with us. And our trust is that these will help us to add glory to your name and growth on our behalf. We thank you for all your blessings. We do so in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Good morning. Today's scripture is taken from uh, Matthew 8, verses 18 to 27, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Then a scribe came, on, came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And another of the disciples said to him, Lord, allow me to first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, a violent storm developed on the sea so that the boat was being covered by the waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. And when they came to him and woke him saying, save us, Lord, we are perishing. He said to them, why are you afraid? O ye of little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea and it became perfectly calm. The men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Thank you, Judy. Each week when we come to the Lord in worship, we come for uh, two purposes. Uh, the first pur purpose is to bring glory to him, uh, to bring glory to his name. The passage that you just read, Judy, is beautiful, and, and it asks a question. It's the same question that the disciples asked. Who is this? that commands the wind and the waves and they obey him. Um, I want you to think about that passage as we uh, continue in our worship this morning. Um, the God who loves us, the God who cares for us, the God who has given to us so much. Uh, also as an act of worship, we give to him and we give to him with our tithes and our offerings. We give to him with our service here at the church and we give to him 
in the service that we have right here on Main Street. So as we uh, continue in worship, uh, listen to this song and allow it to speak to you about how we offer back to God our thanks. <clears throat> Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all your provisions and blessings upon us each and every day. We thank you that you know our needs before we even ask. You know, Lord, that 
even though we're meeting on Zoom and not physically in their building, that all of our expenses are still very high and they remain mostly unchanged. We thank you that when we begin to feel proud or take credit for our accomplishments or possessions, that your word reminds us that everything we are and have comes from you. None of us is self-made. You have given us the abilities and opportunities which have brought us where we are now. The giving of tithes and offerings is only one of many forms of worship. Your word instructs us to bring the first fruits or first of our increase to you as an offering and reminder that everything comes from you and we are completely dependent on you, Lord. Please bless our tithes and offerings as we use them to further your kingdom on earth and lay up treasure in heaven by the spreading of the gospel message and caring for others. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, church. So I want to begin this morning by reading a couple of passages of scripture that um, I believe will help lay a foundation, uh, a platform for the message that I'm going to be speaking on this morning. Now remember, these are not the words of Pastor Andrew. They're God's word. And according to 1 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's word is alive, and his word is active. So, what that means is that according to Hebrews chapter 412, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing even to the point of dividing soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It is able to judge the desires and the thoughts of yours and my heart. Yes, God's word is useful. It's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. His word corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us to do what is right and to, and to thoroughly equip us for every good work that he's prepared for us in advance to do. His word is like the rain and the snow that come down from heaven that water our lives, causing things to bud and to flourish. They're from God. And they're not useless sayings. In fact, they're so powerful that they will achieve the purposes that God has for them this very day. And if you ever wonder why I'm so confident and so excited each week when I come here to speak, it's this reason. I get to share the truth from God, who is the author of life itself. In fact, I believe that when we get together and I get out of the way and speak God's word with confidence, we might even see a miracle right here in our presence. So let's start. Go to Luke chapter 8, verse 22. This is where we're going to be studying this morning. Luke 8, verse 22. Um, and when we look at this story a few weeks ago, we did it through Matthew chapter 8. Judy read us that this morning, and thank you, Judy, for that. Today, we're going to hear from Luke's gospel, the same story, but a little different perspective. Luke 8, starting at 22, says, One day Jesus said to the disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and they started out. But as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. Now stop. Did you notice that? It was Jesus' idea to cross the lake, and yet he wasn't at the oars. He was sleeping. He knew where they were going, though. And he told them, we're going to the other side. And he knew what was coming their way, right? Okay, so let's go back to the verse. Let's go back to the Bible here. Now, a violent windstorm came down on the lake, and the boat started filling up with water, and they were in danger. They came to him and they woke him saying, Master, Master, we are about to die. So he got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. They died down and it was calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? 
But they were afraid and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this? He commands even the winds and the waves, and they obey him. Okay, that was the first set of verses. Now to the next two that come. They come from the book of Philippians. So I want you to turn over to the book of Philippians. In chapters 1 and in chapters 4. Now, a little bit of history about the book of Philippians. Philippians was written by Paul when he was in Rome. Uh, Paul wrote this letter um, in a jail cell, in fact, in a Roman prison cell, awaiting his fate, possibly even execution. Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 12 to 14, says this. It says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my situation, remember, in a jail cell, has actually turned out to advance the gospel. The whole imperial, imperial guard and everyone else knows that I am in prison for the sake of Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having confidence in the Lord because of my imprisonment, now more than ever, dare to speak the word of God fearlessly. Isn't that powerful? Now, look at chapter 4. Flip over just a couple of pages. Verses 11 to 13, Paul says this. He says, I have learned to be content in any circumstance. I have learned, uh, sorry, I have experienced times of need and times of abundance. In any and every circumstance, underline the word circumstance, I have learned the secret of contentment. Whether I go satisfied or hungry, have plenty or nothing, whether I'm able to do all things, I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. For the last several weeks, we've been uh, going through a study to help us find freedom from worry the first week, fear, we went two weeks on that, anger, hurt, and freedom from ourselves. Today, we're going to talk about finding freedom from our circumstances. Have you ever been so caught up in your circumstances that they have robbed you of those things? They've robbed you of joy, peace, and contentment? Today, we're going to go back to a math class equation, and we're going to look at this, this um, I think, a powerful equation for our lives, and it is this. Jesus is greater than your circumstances. In Philippians 4, Paul makes an extremely um, difficult statement to believe. Can you seriously imagine yourself being able to say, believe, and live out his words? I mean, seriously, in the middle of your circumstances, can you honestly say, I have learned to be content in any circumstance? I have experienced time of need. I've experienced time of abundance. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of contentment. Whether I go satisfied or hungry, have plenty or nothing. Have you learned to be content whatever the circumstances are? And to add insult to injury, look at what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 8, verse 18. He says, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What? Why? I, I mean, how? The word circumstance comes from the same root word as we use in math. It's called circumference. The idea is that you could draw a giant circle around yourself, and whatever happens within that bubble, inside that framework, could be defined as your circumstances. It's kind of like a giant bubble. So what's inside your circle or your bubble this morning? What are your current circumstances? This is a tough teaching, but make no mistake, many of the things that are inside of our circle are largely outside of our control. You could insert COVID-19 or government restrictions there. If it wasn't for my circle of trouble, I wouldn't be so angry. I wouldn't be so disappointed, discouraged. 
I wouldn't be so frustrated or irritated or perhaps depressed, worried, afraid. Only if my circumstances were different, life would be better. So work with me here for a minute. If circumstances are what determines whether you and I are thankful and content, then how is it that Paul can say, give thanks in all circumstances? Because honestly, sometimes our circumstances stink. See, it's one thing for somebody who lives in luxury and doesn't have the care of this world to say, give thanks in all circumstances. But that somebody hasn't been where you've been, have they? And they haven't gone through what you've gone through, right? But listen, we know from the scriptures that Paul, this is from the scriptures, Paul did not live a life of ease and comfort. That was not his experience. In 2 Corinthians 11, 24 and forward, we see what was inside Paul's circle. Catch this. It says, Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with a rod. Once I received a stoning. Three times I suffered shipwreck. And night a day I spent adrift on the open sea. I have been on journeys many times, in dangers from rivers, in dangers from robbers, in dangers from my own countrymen, in dangers from the Gentiles, in dangers in the city, in dangers in the wilderness, in dangers at sea, in dangers from false brothers, in work, in hard work and toil, through many sleep sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, many times without food, in cold and without clothing, without enough clothing. Hang on a second. You got to take a breath when you read these words. Paul has gone through stuff that you and I can experience, and in some cases, so much more, right? I mean, seriously, what a wish list. And if that wasn't more. Philippians 4 that we just looked at, we find Paul talking about being content and joyful from a prison cell in Rome. How does he say that? Maybe Paul was just one of those annoyingly optimistic people. That would make it really explain. <laughs> But maybe Paul has just been stoned one too many times, and I'm ta talking that kind of being stoned. Maybe Paul has uh, Norman Vincent Peale on a cassette tape playing over and over and over in his ear all night long just to practice the power of positive thinking. Maybe he's just told himself a lie so many times that eventually he started naively believing it and living it as though it was true, even though it really wasn't. But notice the verse doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. It says give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks when beaten with rods. Give thanks when, um, when I'm being stoned or shipwrecked or disaster strikes. That would be crazy. It would be sadistic. Paul is saying give thanks in all circumstances. So how was Paul really able to give thanks in the middle of being beaten with a rod? How was he really able to give thanks? Well, in the middle of the sea, treading water for a day and a half after being shipwrecked. What was it that allowed Paul to be joyful and content no matter what came into his circle? It comes down to one thing. He recognized that Jesus was greater than his circumstance. It's Jesus that allows you to look at whatever circumstance comes your way and still have an attitude of thanksgiving, contentment, even joy. It's Jesus and nothing more. Not Jesus plus a better job, not Jesus plus a better spouse, not Jesus plus anything or anyone. Jesus is greater than your circumstance and mine. And there's no way that Paul could tell you to be joyful always and give thanks in all circumstances without 
Jesus on his side. Only Jesus allows you to be able to look at whatever circumstance you face, whatever experience you've had in the past, whatever situation you might be going through right now, and still be thankful, joyful, and content. Whatever your circumstances are, Jesus will always be greater than your circumstance. Okay, full stop here. It's time for confession. You see, I struggle with this too. In fact, I've been struggling with it this very week. Isn't it unique that as I've planned this message probably seven or eight weeks ago, that this week I would struggle with this probably more than I do normally? But it's just like God in his grace and mercy to take his powerful, living, effective word and convince me to preach on it when I could have preached on something else. I've been wrestling with these circumstances. And honestly, I sat in my family room just yesterday afternoon in my home, frustrated by my circumstance. I found myself staring at the wall and shaking my head in frustration. Now, I don't think I'm the only one here. In fact, from what I've heard from many of you, you're going through circum similar circumstances. Think for just a moment about what's happening in your life right now. On one side, look at all of the difficult circumstances. Family problems, loneliness, job problems, health issues, your financial situation, your car, or your truck breaks down, the pain of loneliness because you're missing a loved one. And to top it all off, we've got this COVID-19 and all that goes alongside of it. Look at your list. Look at it seriously. This stuff is bad and it hurts. Now pile those all on one side of a scale in your mind. It may take a couple of trips to the scale while you pile all those things up there because some of your pain is heavy and it's hard work. So we'll give you a minute to do that. Now, what I want you to do is take a look at Jesus. Take a look at who he is, what he has done for you, and what he can do, and place him on the other side of the scale. Who wins? If anyone else but Jesus wins, then just maybe your problem is not your circumstances over here. It's that maybe you don't know who Jesus is. Because Jesus is greater than our circumstance. Listen, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about being free. The freedom that you can have in Jesus. The freedom that I'm talking about is knowing that Jesus is with you in the middle of your circle. In the middle of your circumstance. In the middle of your storm. And if you know him, you can be confident and know he is working all things together for the good and for his glory. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, he is in your circle. You don't have to invite him in now. He's there already. If you have faith and repentance and you have done that, you have taken that time to receive him as your savior, savior you've surrendered your life to him. You are never alone. In fact, the name Emmanuel, the name that was given to Jesus as a baby, means God with us. According to Psalm 139, 7 and 8, I love this passage, and it preaches all by itself. It says that you can never escape from his spirit. You can never get away from his presence. If you go up to heaven, he is there. And if you go down to the grave, he's there too. If you know Jesus, he is with you right now in your circumstance. And he will never leave you. Remember the disciples back in Luke chapter 8? Twelve guys in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. There's this wicked, awful storm pounding them. Strong winds beating against them. And their small boat was quickly filling up with water. 
These 12 guys were terrified and they believed that their current circumstances were about to take them down to the bottom of the sea for the very last time. But wait, who was in their circle? Who was in the same circumstance as they were? Right, Jesus was in their boat. He was with them in the middle of their storm. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the author and creator of everything that exists was with them in their circle of pain and in their struggle. With every crushing wave, lightning flash and thunder boom, God was there in Jesus. Listen, we go through storms and difficult times too. And I'm not trying to minimize what you're going through right now. Please understand that. But I am excited about God's word because it gives me confidence. John 16, verse 33. I've read this passage to you so many times in the past, but hear it again fresh for the first time. John 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me, Jesus is saying, you may have peace. In this world and in your bubble, you will have trouble and suffering. But be courageous. I have conquered the world. Yea, God. Listen, I understand that a fierce storm may be pounding you right now. Uh, there's one pounding me. There are hurricane face force winds crashing against you. Maybe your marriage, maybe you're taking on water in your finances or your business, your health, your family, your job, or like the rest of us with these COVID-19 restrictions. If that's where you are, I have really good news for you. And you can experience it today, right now in the middle of your storm, Jesus is greater than any hurricane that you will ever face. And if you're a follower of Jesus, he's with you. The wind and the waves, they still know his name and they still bow at his command. Did you hear that? The wind and the waves still know his name. And when Jesus speaks, they still bow at his command. Yes, Jesus is greater than the circumstances that you and I are in right now. But here's the question. Do you believe that? So look again at Paul's example according to Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13. Paul said this. He said, I have learned to be content in any circumstance. I've experienced times of need and times of abundance. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of contentment, whether I go satisfied or hungry, have plenty or nothing. I'm able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Look again at verse 13. He says, I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, here's the truth. It's one of the most misquoted, most misunderstood verses in all of the Bible. This verse, contrary to what some Christian athletes believe, does not give them superhuman powers to be able to slam dunk the basketball one more time or score that extra goal. Sorry to Steph Curry. What Paul is saying is this. You can endure. You can, can be content. You can praise the name of Jesus in all circumstances because... Christ is with you. So back to Luke chapter 8, the disciples are in a violent storm, right? And they're panicked. And they dared to wake Jesus up in verse 22. Master, master, we're about to die. And the master got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves, the raging waves. They died down and it was calm. 
Then he said to them, where is your faith? But they were afraid and amazed. And they said to one another, who then is this? He commands even the wind and the waves, and they obey him. Why didn't they wake up Jesus sooner? I mean, seriously, why would they try to go through the storm alone? Did they think they've got it covered? They could handle it? This tempest was their circumstance. It was in their circle. Why did they try to struggle alone without Jesus? Why didn't they ask him to grab an oar? Now, with all due respect to the disciples, seriously, I can't figure these nut bars out. But then again, why would you and I go through our our storms alone? If you're looking for the pathway to freedom, you can only find it when you recognize that Jesus is in the same boat as you are, and you welcome him into your circumstance and accept that he will work all things together for the good and for his glory. I want to look at three more passages of scripture. Go over to Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 4. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 4. And if you don't have your Bible with you right now, please write this down because you're going to want to look at these later. It says this, we can rejoice when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops strength and character, and character strengthens our confidence, our confident hope of salvation. Even more, Jesus' brother James said pretty much the same thing in James chapter 1, verses 2 and two to 4. So turn over to James chapter 1. Hebrews, James, John. Hebrews, James, 1 John. And it says this, My brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy when you fall in all circum- sorry, in all sorts of trials, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect effect so that you will be perfect and complete, not deficient in anything. Okay, now turn back to Romans, but this time Romans 8 verses 28 and 29. Many of you know this passage off by heart. Romans 8 28 says, And we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God, who are called according to his purpose. Because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Listen, church family, I get it. You might say, it's easy for you to say that, Pastor Andrew. You've got things pretty much nailed down, but you've got to understand you're not in my shoes, and you're right, I'm not. But what I have done is I've tried to go through storms in my life, battling the wind and the waves on my own strength. And it's not worth the pain or the scars. I've had them. It's not worth being alone in the boat. I can tell you that from personal experience. And I'm not making light of your circumstance. They can be so overwhelming. I understand that. But your freedom is only found in Jesus. And Jesus is working all things together for the good. Jesus is working in your circumstance to help you develop endurance, to refine your character, to give you a confident hope in your salvation, to make you mature and complete, not lacking for anything. Yes, you will become more like Jesus if you allow them to form you. 
You may be going through a lot right now, but it is for his glory. Every storm, every difficult circumstance, even the painful situations with COVID-19. Philippians 1, 12 to 14 said this, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my situation, what has happened to me, has actually turned out to advance the gospel. The whole Imperial Guard and everyone else knows that I am in prison for the sake of Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters having confidence in the Lord because of my imprisonment now more than ever dare to speak the word of God fearlessly. You see, each time Paul was in prison, he wasn't sure if he would be released or if he'd be executed. And even when he was free from prison, he was always in threats for his life. But he saw his troubles and his imprisonment through the lens of holy optimism. Listen, this is not power of positive thinking. This is the power of knowing Christ. The gospel had become known throughout the imperial guard because Paul trusted his savior, Jesus. From Paul's perspective, in the light of the gospel, everything that he suffered served the purpose of bringing glory to Jesus. It was no tragedy that Paul was in prison being persecuted and unjustly maligned. For Paul, it was a privilege. Paul considered it a blessing to be considered worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ Jesus. Listen. Our circumstances put us on stage two, and we can be like all the other actors whining and complaining about the wind and the waves. Listen, I found myself doing that way too many times through COVID. Or as followers of Jesus, we can take our circumstance and use them as a powerful and undeniable opportunity to bring glory to God. According to John 9, verse 3, this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in Jesus. And as Paul said in Philippians 1, 21, as for me to live is Christ, and for me to die in him is gain. Jesus is, a, is greater than your circumstance. And in all your circumstance, he is working for the good, and therefore he receives the glory. Yea, God. Let's pray. Father, this is tough teaching, but your word is true. It's powerful to cut deep into our soul, into our spirit, so that we can get released from the burden of our circumstance. Oh God, if the wind and the waves can cry out to you and they can sit there and they can obey your word, your beckoning, your call, then oh God, why can't we? So I ask in Jesus' name that you would allow us triumph. You would allow us victory over top of our circumstance because we take our eyes off the wind and the waves and get them back on you, Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. God, we cannot do this alone. So I ask Holy Spirit, because you are our comforter, and it says that you will guide us into all truth. I pray that you would strip away anything that I have said that would get in the way. And I pray that we would only focus on your word and we would look to Jesus because Jesus, you are greater than the wind and the waves. Jesus, you are greater than our circumstances. You are greater, Lord Jesus. And when we learn that, we understand how sweet it is to trust you. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. To trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, and to know the Seth. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. follower of Jesus Christ, you are not alone. Perhaps some of you who are on this call are alone because you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. I have great news for you. You don't have to be alone anymore. You can trust him. You can receive him. John 1.12 says very specifically, it says, 
to whomever believed in him, those who called on him, who trusted in his name and received him, they were given the right to be called a child of God. That right is not for everyone. That right is not for everyone in this world. This right is for those who have received him, those who have trusted in his name. Do you want to trust in his name? It's as simple as this. You need to get real with God and you need to repent. I know, ugly word. We don't want to talk repentance. That sounds way too bible But make no mistake, this is the word of God that cuts deep. And if you're not willing to face the sin that is in your life, the sin that's in my life, if I'm not willing to do that, I have no part in the family of God. Repentance is serious business. Repentance means I get real with God and I say, God, I have messed up. I've made a mess of my life. I've screwed up and the only help that I can get is with you. And Jesus says that when we come to him, he will in no way cast you out. It doesn't matter what you've done, how much of a mess you've made of your life. You see, the one who commands the wind and the waves has shed his own blood for you to wash you clean. So if you want that, if you want to be right with Jesus Christ today, if you want to experience him in your boat, you can pray this simple prayer for starting. You could say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I need you to forgive me. I have made a mess of things on my own. And if all of the wind and the waves came, they would never wash my sin away. But you, Lord Jesus, can do that because of your blood. And because of your blood, I receive you as my Savior. Teach me how to live. Teach me how to follow you. And teach me how to trust you in the middle of my wind and waves. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you're joining us for the first time on Facebook Live, I'm really glad that you came and joined us here today. And if you're watching this on a recording um, later on sometime today or maybe even throughout this week or into the future, my prayer is that this would not just be some television show or some broadcast that means nothing and just has good words. I pray that God's word would go out like it promises and would not return unto him void empty, meaningless, useless sayings, but would accomplish everything that he intended it to do. Thank you, Facebook Live, for joining us. God bless you. Look forward to having you join us again next week.